Television, an everyday activity for many people today. But back in the 50s, television was a new invention. TV was amazing, mesmerizing, and brilliant. It started small, with only a few channels and shows, but then it grew into a great phenomenon. Producers thought of different ways to use television, creating several action or drama shows, but then someone recommended using it to educate young children. Producing quality educational television was challenging, but one show helped the educational children's television movement begin. Before 1969, there were very few shows for preschool children. Most shows on the air had tons of commercials, lacked cultural diversity, and were violent. There were superhero and adventure shows such as Spider-Man, Rin Tin Tin, and The Lone Ranger. Many of these shows were very theatrical and contained lots of violence. Other programs for children in the early to mid-60s were cartoons, puppet shows, or variety shows. Although these shows were entertaining and plentiful on the networks, they didn't actually teach young children basic concepts and skills. The government became concerned with the lack of quality children's programming, especially after the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Newton Minow, called television a vast wasteland in a speech to the National Association of Broadcasters in 1961. He claimed, after reading the results of a study, Television in the Lives of Our Children, that television was not, quote, realizing its full potential as a carrier of ideas and information. TV was still a young medium and already there was a cry for reform because of too much violence and the untapped possibility of using television for educational purposes for children. An important factor in the reform of children's television was the formation of the activist group Action for Children's Television, or ACT, in 1967. A mother in Boston, Peggy Charon, along with three other Boston mothers, decided to form the group after feeling that children's TV was too violent. They also wanted children's programming to include less commercial advertising. They helped advance the revolution to change children's television by petitioning the FCC to regulate advertising during children's shows and requesting age-specific programming from the TV networks. Their efforts to improve children's television programming involved bringing many cases to the courts over the years, including a major case against the FCC in 1987 and then the passage of the Children's Television Act of 1990. Some of the first educational programs in the 50s were shows like the Ding Dong School, which kept kids engaged by having them move and do exercises, and Captain Kangaroo, which used cartoons and puppets to teach. Although the Ding Dong School went off the air due to ads that frustrated parents, Captain Kangaroo pleased middle class families because there were few commercials, no inappropriate sponsors, and children gained knowledge while watching the show. Although Captain Kangaroo proved to be a popular children's show, there was still a need for educational programming for young preschool children. Captain Kangaroo sometimes taught concepts such as government and legislature, topics well above the understanding of young children. In the mid-60s, a commission of 15 people was created by a foundation called the Carnegie Corporation in New York, and they released a report that supported a proposal to strengthen educational television by creating local public television stations funded through federal and local grants, private funding, and donations. In 1967, the Public Broadcasting Act was signed into law and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting was formed, supporting non-commercial and educational television. There is now a strong foundation for the broadcasting of more educational television shows. Joan Gangs Cooney, a television producer at the time, was asked by the Carnegie Corporation to write a paper about the potential uses of television in preschool education. After months of research and interviews, she wrote the paper and presented it to Carnegie. In her paper, she formed an idea called the Preschool Moment. The Preschool Moment is the idea that you learn basic skills that you use for the rest of your life in preschool like being social, sharing, and learning to count. While other shows were teaching more advanced material, no show taught basic skills. Also, the characters were not lifelike, so the kids could not relate to them. Cooney thought of the idea of making a show for this purpose. In her paper, Cooney outlined a show that would teach several concepts such as time, number relations, basic language skills, reasoning skills, colors, and counting. This was the start of the creation of Sesame Street, and her paper was the blueprint for the show itself. So I 
turned in, and I, I suggested in the report a show something like Sesame Street be created. I even talked about what the components would be in it and so on, some of which found their way into the actual show, and suggested something like CTW be created, although... This show would be for all families with preschoolers, but it was aimed at lower-class suburban families who could not afford a preschool education. Cooney decided to join the Carnegie Corporation and began creating the Children's Television Workshop, or CTW. She hired several producers that had formerly worked on Captain Kangaroo, along with a few writers and other creative artists. It was suggested to Cooney that she try to hire a well-known puppeteer named Jim Henson to work on the show, and she was surprised to find that he agreed. What they wanted to do was to take and use some of the techniques that had been created for commercials and for television and apply them to this preschool, to the preschool kid. No one had ever really aimed any television at these kids. And what they found was, at least in the United States, these kids spent an enormous amount of time watching television. And so they found that, you know, or the thought was, at least if we can design something for these guys, you know, that will just benefit them. They created five demo episodes and showed them to children of a hundred different families in Philadelphia. They received positive feedback and the show was aired in the fall of 1969. In the first season of Sesame Street, 196 stations carried the show, including 16 commercial stations and places where there were no local educational channels. The shows contained much of what Cooney described in her paper for the Carnegie Corporation. It was set on an urban street so that children could relate to a real setting. It had kids in areas just like what children were used to seeing in their everyday lives. It included real-life clips, animation, and puppet characters to keep kids intrigued throughout the whole episode. The puppet characters, created by Henson, were used to portray different traits. One example is Big Bird, who is a naive and innocent character, much like a child. Big Bird often made mistakes and would be helped by adults on the show. Jim Henson's puppets, called Muppets, became a very important part of the show. Characters such as Big Bird, Ernie, Grover, Bert, and Oscar the Grouch taught children about relationships and emotions in addition to the skills and concepts outlined in Cooney's paper that were implemented throughout the show. Jim Henson was an incredibly talented and imaginative artist, with most of his colleagues, including Frank Oz, referring to him as a creative genius. Every episode of the show was written after extensive research and consultation with child psychologists, curriculum experts, and educators, and the content is thoroughly tested throughout the taping process. Sesame Street was well received by the audience. Not only did kids enjoy watching the program, they learned more than they had from any other show on TV. Because the format of the show changed throughout the program, children remained interested. The episodes included many different races of children on screen, and even taught some Spanish, like the numbers 1 through 10 or hello. It taught children about basic skills, relationships, showed diversity, and was entertaining. Six little kittens play nearby as the queen sings a lullaby. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seems like I'm always thinking of you. No, you do me wrong now. Your grip is strong. Sesame Street led to an entire reform of the way children's television was made. More shows decided to add education into their episodes because of the success of Sesame Street. Also, with the creation of public television stations as platforms for educational TV and activist groups pushing for better programming for kids, the movement to reform and improve children's television truly began. The reform of children's television, which began with the creation of Sesame Street, still impacts us today. Without Sesame Street laying a strong foundation for educational children's television, current shows like Blue's Clues and Dora the Explorer would not have the success and support that they enjoy today. Sesame Street has been so successful that they are still creating new episodes, 43 years later, and it is still a cornerstone program for young children. The show is aired in more than 120 countries worldwide and is the most watched children's show in the world. And that's how we get to Sesame Street.